Good morning. I think um, the worship team may have a case of the giggles this morning, so you'll just have to bear with us. Um, not a bad problem to have, right? We get to experience a lot of joy when we're around God's people and around each other. Um, let's stand together. We're going to worship this morning. We're so glad you guys are here. You know, it kind of feels a little gloomy outside. <laughs> I woke up and I was like, wait, wait where's the sun? Huh. Well, we are going to worship this morning. We are going to praise the name of our God. We're going to magnify him and we're going to make much of his name. Um, we really enjoy getting to do that as a church family and as a church body coming together. Um, even those that are not able to be here physically, we've had some church members that have still had to worship online due to health reasons and I'm so grateful for that technology that we can do that and wherever we are, we can still worship together. So um, let's just worship as a big family and uh, seek to glorify our Jesus and make much of him this morning. strength is gone you're the one who calls me on you are the life you are the fight that's in my soul oh your resurrection power burns like fire in my heart when waters rise i lift my eyes up to your throne Let's 
morning. Oh, what a great way to get things started. You know, the Word of God says that where two or more are gathered, I am with you, right? And what an amazing thing as we gather together this morning as the family of God that we get to, to praise his name and know that we're conquerors, not because of our own power, not because of our own strength, not because of our own abilities, but because he is with us and he gives us that strength, right? What an amazing thing. So that's our desire at, at National Hills, right? We want to connect you to that Christ, to know that God the same way that we get to each and every day and to be part of his community, to live this life out knowing that you have each other to lift you up and to point you back to him and then to be able to share that message with the world. So if you're a visitor today or if you're watching for the first time online, man, we welcome you. We're so excited that you're here. We are just loving um, the fact that God has brought you to us. So we want to pray for you. We want to love on you. We want to share with you. So please take a moment, fill out that Connect card either digitally or here in the building um, and let us just love on you and, and share the love of Christ with you. But let's continue to worship this morning. Let's praise his name and let's uh, shake this building a little bit. Absolutely. Um, we're going to continue with worship and I'm going to read this scripture for us, Psalm 145. Um, I saw this in one of my devotions this week and knew that I needed to just read this out as an encouragement. A Psalm of David says, I will exalt you, my God and King, and I will praise your name forever and ever. I will praise you every day. Yes, I will praise you forever. Great is the Lord. He is most worthy of praise. No one can measure his greatness. Let each generation tell its children of your mighty acts. Let them proclaim your power. I will meditate on your majestic, glorious splendor and your wonderful miracles. Your awe-inspiring deeds will be on every tongue. I will proclaim your greatness. Everyone will share the story of your wonderful goodness. They will sing with joy about your righteousness. The Lord is merciful and compassionate, slow to get angry, and filled with unfailing love. The Lord is good to everyone. He showers compassion on all his creation. All of your works will thank you, Lord, and your faithful followers will praise you. They will speak of the glory of your kingdom. They will give examples of your power. They will tell about your mighty deeds and about the majesty and glory of your reign. For your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, your rule throughout all generations. The Lord always keeps his promises, and, his, and his, he is gracious in all he does. The Lord helps the fallen and lifts those who bent beneath their loads. The eyes of all look to, to you in hope. You give them their food as they need it. When you open your hand, you satisfy the hunger and the thirst of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in everything he does. He is filled with kindness. The Lord is close to all who call on him. Yes, to all who call on him in truth. He grants the desires of those who fear him. He hears their cries for help and rescues them. The Lord protects all those who love him, but he destroys the wicked. I will praise the Lord and may everyone on earth bless his holy name forever and ever. So let's just continue worshiping. He became sin who knew no sin that we might become his righteousness. He humbled himself and carried the cross. Love so amazing. Love so Jesus Messiah, name above all names, blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel, the rescue for sin.
song we've done before it's just been probably at least over a year um this is a song talking about the resurrection so if you want to even just close your eyes and, and meditate and think on these words as we sing them um but they should be familiar like i said we have done it but um just take some time and and spend this in in worship as we go into a time of getting into the word in just a moment The head that once was crowned with thorns is crowned with glory now. The Savior knelt to wash our feet. Now at his feet we bow. The one who Resurrecting me, yes. the two were sold. 
Soldiers watched in vain Was borrowed for three days His body there would not remain Our God has robbed the grave Our God has robbed the grave Your name And that you make all things new because of the work of Jesus Christ coming back from the dead. We praise you, God, that in this life that is filled with discouragement and disappointment, we have joy in Christ Jesus because of the resurrection of Christ from the dead. Now we ask that you would enable our hearts to be lifted, our eyes to see what only your Holy Spirit could illuminate us to see through your word. We ask that you would transform us through the power of Jesus Christ and make us like him in this place. We pray that souls that are dead would come to life. Those who are discouraged would find their source of strength in you. Those who need truth and conviction would find that in your word. And Lord, you would do all that you intend in this place. In these moments, we ask for Christ's sake. Amen and amen. Well, you can head back to Children's Church, kids, at this time. Uh, and we would encourage you, uh, as you're uh, here hearing the word in this place, to be praying for those who are uh, under the hearing of God's word as, we, uh, as, as they hear. Well, good to see you. Glad that you are here. Isn't it good to be a part of what God is doing around the world and even here locally as we get to gather as believers and encourage one another even so much the more as we need encouragement, as the day of Christ approaching, approaches. Well, I've always been fascinated um, since my ninth grade year, Miss Maddox was my life science teacher. She was a wonderful and a, just a kind lady, and she taught me what was, I guess, the precursor to biology. Uh, and one of those things that she did was to teach at least in part, about the human systems. Did you know that there are 11 or some say 12 human systems? The muscular system, the skeletal system, the the neurological system, and they go on. It's an amazing thing how God has made our bodies. Did you know, according to the Cleveland Clinic, that your body contains 60,000 miles of blood vessels? Yeah, I know, right? It's like... No words. It's just 60,000 miles. Of, that, of course, is if you were to line them all up, which I don't advise you to do this morning. You, you, if you were to line all those up, you would, you would go around the world a few times. Isn't that just crazy? According to a heart health line report in the 2014 study, the total surface area of your intestines is about half the size of a badminton court. I know you're really thrilled to know that today, and you might need that one day if you're playing trivia. What is half the size? Okay, I know it's, you don't want to, don't image it, all right? Don't, don't go there in your mind. But isn't it remarkable? All that lives in you. It exists in you, and it all works together. National Geographic tells us there are approximately 37.2 trillion individual cells in your body. 
from those cells which make up the complex nature of your vital organs to the cells making up your skin, 37 trillion. You are a unique and marvelous creation. What's amazing to me is that they all generally work together in order in your body. I mean, think about that. you got all of these individual cells, and you've got all of these individual systems, but somehow they function together in a cohesive manner so that you do this very thing we call living. You do this thing which is functioning, and you're able to exercise uh, the things that your body was designed to do. All of that requires ordering and structure. There's one system, of course, all of them as we're designed, but one system which is absolutely essential to your existence and your growth, and you might be surprised that that system is the skeletal system. According to one uh, report, it gives the body its shape, allows movements, makes the blood cells, provides protection for organs, and stores vital minerals. Put simply, your skeletal system, your bones and the ligaments and all those things which hold those things together, they are vital, otherwise you'd just be a giant blob. I know some of us, frankly, are closer than others to that, but the reality is your bones give you shape and allow your body to grow as it's intended. In other words, God put in the human body physical order so that the rest of it can grow properly. And we should not be surprised that he did the very same thing for the church family or his body on earth. He gave it order and organization so that it could grow properly. Now, we're looking in 1 Thessalonians today as we speed toward the end of this incredible book. It has been a great year in the Word of God, at least for me. I don't know about you, but I've gotten loads out of this. And uh, we've been spending time in this last chapter as Paul has transitioned to talking about the, from talking about the second coming of Christ to uh, talking about what does that mean now for our lives. In other words, because Jesus is coming again, it ought to have some tangible, practical effect. And he's entered a section as we begin today, starting in chapter 5, verse 12 through about verse 21, Uh, where he gives 19 separate commands. Now, if you're a musician, you'll appreciate this analogy. This is like staccato. This is boom, 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 boom. Rapid fire succession commands. But they're not randomized commands. They're not unrelated commands. These are not afterthoughts of Paul that tacks on and says, oh yeah, I probably should have said this in the letter. Rather, these are integral and important commands and scripturally consistent commands for how the church ought to function with itself. We'll look at that today. How Christians ought to function within themselves. We're talking about what do you do when you don't have inner peace. I think that's next week or the week thereafter. And then how to function out in this world. So he gives us final instructions. And that's what the next three or four, uh, five weeks or so, you know how I get, right? A little long sometimes, so I'll, but, I'm, but I'm more forgiving, right? So I'll cut the message off and you'll, you'll be more forgiving when I go along, all right? But today we're going to look at inst- final instructions for the church body itself. Now just a quick backup if you're wondering and trying to remember who these people were. These were fairly new Christians. The vast majority of them probably didn't know Jesus for more than a year. That, at least if you construct the timetable of Paul's travels from the book of Acts, you can look and see that his coming back to them in the writing of the second letter was somewhere within a year. It could be as much as a year and a half, but not more than that. This was the first letter of Paul to any church. There would be a number that follow, but this is a very early letter, somewhere about 53 A.D., uh, probably roughly 20 or 22 years after the death and resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ. So what we're talking about is early Christianity here. And he's already mentioned that their faithful gospel witness in chapter 1 was, was being heard all across uh, the Roman Empire, specifically in the area of Greece and Macedonia. And that their testimony for living faithfully, even though they were experiencing a great deal of adversity, that faithfulness was also being testified by other believers in the region. In other words, Paul was confident these were Christians, and he was not only confident, he was encouraging them to remain steadfast 
in the middle of difficulty. They were growing and spreading that gospel message, but there were some who were coming in now, as Satan always seems to do, right? Just when things are going well. Can I get a witness? Right? Satan creeps in, and there are some false teachers who had come, and some who maybe just simply misunderstood the coming of Christ. And 2 Thessalonians, the second letter Paul sends to this group of Christians, expresses this disordered theology even more. They were thinking that maybe Jesus already came and they missed it. So Paul writes them to reassure them. And then finally he says, this coming of Christ, which is still to come, has ethical daily responsibilities. So he talks about some of those today. And he begins with how we relate to one another in the body of Christ. With all of that background, it's important that Paul understood they needed to know how to operate. Remember, these are early Christians. They didn't know. They didn't have a long-standing tradition. They, didn't, they weren't under the teaching of God's Word for 20 or 30 years. They didn't even have a completed New Testament. Remember, this is the beginning of, of at least half of the New Testament being written, this letter itself. So what are they to do? How are they to know each other? How do they make decisions within the church? Who, what's supposed to be taught? All of these things have to be answered. And Paul reminds us that there are those who are called in and among the body of Christ to lead the church, primarily pastors and teachers. And in doing so, God is kind to provide order so that the church can be structured and strong and healthy and perform its function, its mission. These pastors or leaders that are mentioned here oversee the family and function. Or we might say they oversee, they are called actually overseers elsewhere in Scripture. They oversee the members and the mission. Now we're going to see that's not without accountability or that's not without recourse, but it is important to see that that is the general order that God provides here. Any group of people over any particular time has potential for conflict. Can I get a witness to that? You've been married for more than a couple days, a couple hours. You've had children who now have learned to speak or even before, you can sense there's something in there that they want something, even before they can formulate words. Any organization, any business, any company, any entity has to have some structure that minimizes uh, and reduces the amount of conflict and promotes growth and strength. And that's, the, that's why in rapid fire succession here, Paul gives to this church these 19 commands, and he begins by speaking of them in the church. He wants this church to be healthy, to have integrity both personally and doctrinally and for it, for its own soul, to be strong. And so let's look, we're just going to look at two verses, verses 12 and verse 13, at these brief verses, but power-packed they are. Here we go. Verse 12, Paul writes this, 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 12, you follow along in your copy of God's Word. I do hope you bring um, a copy of God's Word with you, whether digital, I know that's so convenient, Something, I think still, I don't think you can over-spiritualize it. Something about having a physical copy in your hand, but I know for convenience, oftentimes I have it on my phone. But what, however you're reading it, um, let's, uh, let's look at verse 12. We ask you, brothers, keep that phrase in mind, it's really interesting. We ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you. So here now we know we're talking primarily about those who are laboring in the gospel uh, specifically and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them, second verb, and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work, third verb, be at peace among yourselves. So clearly here in these two verses, he's talking about how to get along, how to relate, how to order and function within the church body. And he begins by a request. He says, we ask. This is um, Greek for we beseech. Now, I don't know if your children come up to you when they're hungry or your grandchildren when they, when they want a little extra spending money and say, grandfather, I beseech you for this. Or, or, no one uses those terms anymore, but you understand that a beseech is a, an earnest, heartfelt urging or pleading. And this is what Paul is doing. Now, Paul does have the spiritual authority to command them. In fact, he's about to issue a number of commands. But this is a polite and gracious way of saying, hey, I want to come to you not from my state of authority, which I do have, but I want to come to you and appeal to you as my fellow brother 
We're, as, my, as my sister in Christ, we are family members first together. We are forged by the relationship that we have because of the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. We're, we're brothers and sisters. And so my first, my first appeal doesn't come from the authority which I rightfully have in Jesus Christ. My first appeal comes to you because we're family together and we, we kind of should learn how to, you know, like, like the husband. He, he ought to, if he has any sense in his head whatsoever, not come to his wife and say, I'm the head of this home. That boy ought to get slapped in the back of the head, right? <laughs> we have one true head. That's Jesus Christ. You're the wife. No, no, no. You know, you know, that's not how you appeal to someone's heart. That's not how you come across with a sense of authority. Though, though the husband might say, ultimately, you know, I don't want to be the one that has to make some final decision. But where there is some disagreement, we may pause. We may. But, but the point is that he comes and asks on the basis of a heartfelt family relationship. He could have pulled that apostle card and laid it at the table and say, I have important authority uh, for all matters relating to the church, and he would have been biblically correct, but that's not his heart. Do you see the difference? (laughs) Authority understands that the heart is the primary means of of convincing, and and if someone just has to submit (laughs) in that sort of sense, then then you've kind of lost the battle to begin with. Anyone tracking with me? For your children, for your relationship in the family, at your workplace, and certainly here in the the church. But notice, though, that he does get back to the heart of the issue. He says, I'm asking you, and this is my desire, that you respect those who labor among you. Now, I'm going to give you just a couple of, or three, really, quick points to see. We'll hit them individually, but three quick sub-points to show the description of these who labor. It's not specifically named that these are pastor elders, uh, te- elder teacher or pastor teachers in the, in the passage, but it sure seems to sin, uh, seem that way by all the, by all the indications, indicators. I'm going to show you real quickly, and then we'll break it down. Um, he calls those who labor among you, uh, verse 12. And then notice the, the, the other, so that's the first descriptor of gospel ministers, those who labor, those who admonish you, um, in the Lord, uh, and then he says, uh, those who, uh, verse 13, those who are at work among you. So those who labor, uh, and then those who are over you, I should say, and then those who uh, admonish you, all right? So those are the descriptors. We'll get to those a little more detail here, but let's look at this command. He says, respect those who are among you. Literally, the Greek word most simply translated is the word no. Um, the, the word means to know or to recognize or to understand. Now, it's translated in most English translations to respect because the idea is you are knowing who this person is and whom God has placed among you to lead in such a way that it leads to respect. But at its basic meaning, it means don't assume you know someone. Actually know them. Now, pause for just a moment. Think about the implications of that. You know, a lot of times we think we know people. You tracking with me? We think we, we know them, meaning we, we kind of presume what, why they're doing something. We presume motives. We, pre, we, we assume certain sort of ambitions or certain sort of thoughts. But Scripture tells us to actually know the person. In other words, get to know who they really are, their really heart. Now, it's true. Some people are harder to get to know. Some people hold another person at an arm's length. But the reality is we are to do more than make assumptions about people, but to generally know them and to recognize them for more than just what you think they are. Specifically here, the the context teaches us to know someone as deserving of honor. And contextually, it means to show them that respect or to take special note of them. Again, to treat them according to their office. A gospel minister is someone who labors among you. That is to say, here, they are someone who works among you. That word labor in verse 12 is a special Greek word that Paul uses. A number of words that could be used, ergon, for work, but he uses a word which implies sweaty, (laughs) toilsome labor, the hard work. Friday, uh, um, I usually take Fridays, uh, since Sundays are a bit of a work day for me. Um, Not a lot of rest on Sundays. We kind of come away exhausted, really. Um, but so I take Fridays as a day off, and uh, Friday I decided we had been away, you know, for 
vacation and then for the convention as well. And my grass was this thick. I mean, literally that thick. And it's a really mature, stable grass, which means it was just all like thatched together, not patchy. And, and it, it took me seven hours to mow my front side and back lawn. Seven hours. And with the heat index, it was 103. I came in and peeled my shirt off. I mean, it just, it didn't even, it just, I mean, I was so sweaty. I know you're all like, we didn't, we didn't need that image. That was so, just, just hot and sweaty. And I just wilted into the chair. I had, I had several liquid IVs. Those are like, dry packs you can put into water that, that rehydrate you, and about three or four Gatorades, and I still was cramping everywhere. I mean, I was absolutely worthless afterwards, exhausted. Well, this is the kind of physical labor and toil, uh, the, the analogy of that physical labor and toil that Paul is speaking about the gospel ministry. Obviously, it doesn't involve as much physical, uh, manual labor as much, but it does speak to the rigorous nature of pastoral or uh, gospel work. That is to say, it is not necessarily a harder occupation than any other, but there is something about it. Church, think about this. How many professions are there where there is a consummate target on your back? I don't mean to say that Satan has good wishes for any of us, (laughs) but, but he would very happily take out someone in spiritual leader, knowing the fallout from that. There is a very clear intensification of satanic attack, a spirit of disillusionment, a spirit of temptation, a spirit of discouragement, a spirit of despondency. You know, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, one of the great preachers of the 18th century in London, Metropolitan Tabernacle, suffered from the greatest struggle of depression, constantly battled it. One of the most eloquent and well-written speakers and pastors, but constantly was as though a spirit of of discouragement and depression would hover over him like a dark cloud of night. Why? Because Satan knows. He, He loves to target those who will have collateral damage if they fall. Believer, I mean this with a great amount of sincerity. Your pastoral team, pastors across this nation, need your prayers. I don't mean to in any way elevate the position of pastor over any other believer in in a sense of, uh, of importance or unequal. I'm just talking about the intensity of attack which comes It is always there. It is a job which is never done. You don't meet a quota. You don't don't get a number of widgets completed at the end of the day and think, well, good. That's a little better than last year. There are always lost souls. There's always greater territory. And those lost souls who become saved don't always act like they're saved. (laughs) The Christian life's not always a forward progress, an upward gain which means believers like you and like me, we don't always go in the right direction after we're redeemed, which means the pastor's constantly going after believers and chasing the sheep down and going, hey, come back. I know it looks greener over there, but it's not. There are dangerous rocks and cliffs over there. So, so even when someone's won to faith in Christ, the nature of of Biblical ministry, of of Bible ministry, of pastoral ministry, is is a constant going. The the job of a believer is is never done because we're never fully sanctified until the day of Christ comes. In addition to that, the pastor and other leaders are under constant scrutiny. Whatever you do is under the public eye, and to much degree, that should be that way. And that's why there are qualifications in 1 Timothy 3 and in Titus for uh, for pastors and for those uh, who are called elders, it, because there is a higher degree of accountability. Not many of you should become teachers, James says, because there is a greater accountability. We are doing eternal work, which means <laughs> sometimes the work you do seems to have had absolutely no effect. 
And you don't really know <laughs> if your life has any actual productive value or meaning until eternity. Can I just be frank with you? It's a bit frustrating sometimes. <laughs> it just is. This, this is not pastor venting, by the way. I'm just kind of giving you insight into the mind and heart of someone who, who shares. All of us want to know we're making a difference and an impact, right? No one wants to go through the end of their life and go, well, I, think, I think I'm not so much. <laughs> you know? we, we want to make, but you don't really know. I mean, you, sometimes you see little evidences and you see signs that God is working and moving. And sometimes marriages are restored. <laughs> Praise his name. Sometimes lives are saved and people confess sins and turn and, and they're baptized and you go, praise God. God has redeemed someone else and I might have been a little bit of the part of the process. Someone had planted a seed, someone had watered and I might have just gotten in on the harvest. That's incredible. Every now and then you see some of that and it's incredible. But sometimes you don't always see that. So the point is the nature of this work is difficult. Paul knows that. I mean, he's lived it. And so he goes, listen, respect those who are laboring among you. They're working among you. Today we live in, and, and let me just highlight this phrase, among you. Those who labor among you. Think about the significance of that phrase. They're with you. They're in your presence. They, they live life with you. They, are, they, they don't just rub shoulders with you. They're in the trials with you and they're in the celebrations with you. They're there at the funeral and they're there at the birth of the child and the grandchild. They're, they're there when you are happy and they're there when you're sad. They're there when you want to walk and they're there when you want to run. They're there when you want to walk out on God and when you want to run with all of your passion for Him. They're, they're among you. And that's not to overstate their importance, but it is to say we live in a day with great media access. And I think that's a good thing by and large. But like everything, there are two sides of the coin and there are two edges to a sword. And the very good thing can also be a very bad thing. That means, and I've not really experienced this, at least not, not to my face. If it happens, I don't even know. So praise God for that. I'll live in that ignorance. But what happens is that people compare sometimes those in gospel ministry to those in more public spheres. People who have big lights and flashy stages and big platforms and great successes and book deals and TV interviews. And, and oftentimes we forget that those who deserve your respect are those who labor among you. Notwithstanding that those who are faithful to the gospel and have more of a public presence should also be held in high regard. But there's something sweet. There's something heavenly, celestially significant about those who are there with you. Are you tracking with me? And again, no one has ever said, I wish you were as good as that guy. I've never, in all of the years, I've never heard that. Praise God. Because I'm pretty feeble and fragile and, and I'm just being real with you. And I, don't, I probably wouldn't receive that well. The Lord would have to work stuff in me. Right? I'm, I'm not saying that because this is a reactionary message in any way. But, but there is something biblical about those who minister among you. There's something biblical about getting your primary teaching from the local church. I'm so grateful for supplemental teaching. I listen to podcasts. I listen to sermons. I read books. I just ordered another one this morning. I mean, we should definitely not have just one voice speaking to us, right? That can get a little twisted if we're not careful. And that voice that is speaking to you from the pulpit, those voices that are speaking to you uh, as, as pastoral and elder uh, voices, th those should be consistent, right, with other... You shouldn't have a unique message because that's called a cult, right? Are you tracking with me? But there's, but there's something about getting the, the, the message and getting the word from those who are laboring among you. And again, that is really important for the pastor, for the missionary, for the laborer in the field of souls. Listen to this. This is, might be revolutionary for you. You are their trophy. You say, well, that sounds a little, that sounds a little off. Well, if I'm off, then Paul's off. Because <laughs> in, um, in Philippians, he calls, them, he calls them, the believers who are living for the Lord, his joy and his crown. The very thing he's going to present before God in eternity are the people of God. Think about how God ordered that. That is a beautiful thing. 
it can be abused. It can be manipulated. It can be scripturally unscriptural. I don't think that's possible. But anyway, it's a bit of an oxymoron. In, in, in other words, it, people can twist that for their own manipulative and personal gain. That is absolutely true. But it does not, it does not inauthenticate the real truth that when God's people are living for God, it is a testament to those who are laboring among them. Notice it's not just those who uh, labor among, uh, but it says in verse 12, those who are over you. Now, can we just be honest with each other? Not many of us like this phrase, someone who is over us. It sounds strong. <laughs> it sounds uh, like uh, <laughs> oppression. It sounds, we think of all of the abuses and injustices that someone who is over someone might begin to bring. But the reality is God did set an order. In fact, this word over you it tr is translated set over you, rule over you, manage or direct, to guide or provide care with oversight. And that's really the picture of a, of a pastor. Not singularly, that, that's kind of dangerous, but but largely, the pastoral team or, or those who are called pastors, elders, pastor teachers in 1 Timothy 3, and this is also used in 1 Timothy 5 or 17, by the way, of pastors who oversee the church. The, the general membership and the general mission of the church is largely within the care of those who are called into gospel ministry. This phrase over you is an expression of authority, but not that dominant, harsh um, autonomous sort of authority that demands followership no matter what, right? That's not the Spirit of Christ, is that? And you know that the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and long-suffering, right? patience and gentleness, kindness, goodness. Those kinds of things are to typify this kind of leader as they are to every Christian. But God has placed pastor teachers in the church to give a direction, and that leadership is there. That assumes accountability within the body of Christ. When, when we read about authority and think about that, oftentimes we cringe because, again, we think about the potential abuses. We've seen those who have abused the trust uh, that has been given to them. But it is the supernatural design and the order. There has to be a structure in the church just as there has to be a structure in the body or it won't function as God designed it. But notice this qualifying phrase that God has. This is an important one. It says, those who are over you in the Lord. Just as parents obey your children in the Lord doesn't mean blind obedience by children to their parents. Just as wives submitting to your, your husbands in the Lord doesn't mean doing whatever they say. It means insofar as that is, in, that is what they're doing is consistent scripturally with what the Lord says to do. So that qualifier there makes it a very important one. So by remaining in the Lord, not by man's appointment or man's empowerment, they are serving in the trust of the Lord, not after some power lust or some other thing. But the point is, this is a holy calling, and it has holy consequences. Think about this. You know, the Bible says that the overseer, pastor, pastor bishop, elder, all of these things are one term in Scripture, is going to give an account for your souls. Think about that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stand before God one day, and he's going to say, what about, and he's going to name you. I, <laughs> how, do, how do I stand before Christ in that day with your souls that I give an account for? That is a heavy weight. That's why your prayers, <laughs> right? That's why when you call, you go, I, I, <laughs> I don't want that. You're right. Unless you're called of God, again, not, it's, this is not better than or higher than. This is just different vocations and different ministry settings. But this is why the, the commandment to respect is so important because there's so much writing on the line. Here's what Hebrews 13 verse 17 says. Obey your leaders and submit to them for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will give an account. 
Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, right? The groaning pastor's not a great pastor. <laughs> I can't believe I have to do this. Almost, you know. Like the, like the lady one time who said to me, not here, <laughs> vacation Bible school would be great if it weren't for the kids. You, know I mean? like, you might be missing something there. <laughs> ministry. I've heard pastors say ministry would be great, jokingly, but a little serious. Ministry would be great if it weren't for the people. Ministry is people. <laughs> it is people. You can't get around it, right? And not with groaning, for that would not be an advantage to you. Listen to Acts 20, verse 28, when Paul is speaking to the elders in Ephesus who have gathered at the seashore. It's really a touching scene in Acts 20. They're gathered at the seashore, and Paul knows this is probably the last time he's going to see them, and he's en route to Jerusalem. He knows he's going to be bound hand and foot in Jerusalem and, and then probably taken to Rome captive of Nero, and it will be more than likely uh, some of the last times he sees them. This is what he says to these pastor teachers, these elders in Ephesus. Acts 20, verse 28. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit, not you, the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. It's his church. He obtained it. He owns it. He is the head. But he's made you overseers as pastors, so take care that you to that flock that you superintend. It's a great responsibility. Notice this third description, uh, which reminds us to respect those who are in charge. By the way, this may so, this may, sir, I hope this sermon doesn't sound self interested, uh, uh, sound like I'm preaching in self interest. I guess that's the beauty and freedom of preaching expositorily. When you're just going through a passage of scripture, you're just preaching whatever's the next text in front of you. You're not picking it out because of any sort of circumstance that's happened. And this is, I'm not preaching this message because there's any sort of open conflict that I know of. If there is a conflict, I'd probably need to know, but I don't know of it. So I'm not preaching this in reaction to anything, but because it's the next passage and um and he tells us that there are those who are among you these pastor elder teachers these are those who admonish you that word admonish comes from two greek words which he smashed together in this amalgamation of words it is from the greek word mind and the greek verb to put so the word admonish is to put into the minds of someone one of the roles of a pastor teacher of an elder is to put into the mind truth of God's people. Not that you can't learn and discover truth. In fact, we should all be like the Bereans who are searching the scriptures daily to make sure the things that are taught are so. Amen? Come on, church. I think you're like that. I think many of you are biblical students. You love God's word. You listen to God's word. You read it. You nourish your own souls. God forbid that Sunday's the only day you eat. Oh, that was a really... Silent reply, or non-reply, really. <laughs> God forbid Sundays are the only days you eat. I mean, you know, I mean, I do hope you come with a voracious appetite Sunday. I hope you come going, may he never stop. <laughs> no, not so much. Okay, but I mean, I'm saying, I hope that you come going, I want to hear God's word proclaimed. It is food for my soul. But again, I hope that you're nourishing yourself on a daily basis. That being said, there are times when the pastor has the clear, sacred responsibility of putting into the mind things that either believers haven't thought of or things that believers need correcting on. In fact, this word carries with it a strong connotation of correction. And that may be probably the most difficult part of, of the pastoral role is Offering up correction, because it has to be done in gentleness. It has to be done with grace. The Bible says, speak the truth. Help me out. What's the next, what are the next two words? Speak the truth in love. You know, the, the pastor just goes off on his people. That's no good, right? Now, some people like a good beating, you know? <laughs> oh, really whooped up on us today, you know? <laughs> I, I knew some people that were like that. It wasn't preaching unless you made them feel completely inferior. You're like, I, think, I don't think it's healthy for you. You need to hear the truth and the Holy Spirit needs to work that truth in you through his holy word, right? I don't have to make you feel bad for anything. That's not my, that's not my role. The conviction of the Holy Spirit is ample enough power to do that. Hallelujah. Someone say, praise God. The pastor doesn't have to condemn the people. There's, he has to. In fact, this word is, 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 is the word nuthetic, which if any of you kind of are familiar with counseling, it's about a wholesome kind of counsel. The pastor must admonish God's people 
on the basis of God's word, with healthy biblical counsel. That is to say, sometimes we warn, but we do so without embittering in as much as it's possible. The pastor is a gospel communicator tasked with the role and responsibility of putting truths in the minds of people. Hopefully, these aren't original truths, (laughs) right? Uh, these, These are to be biblical truths, which you are generally familiar with, but might need clearer or more enlightenment and illumination from. But this is not a mindless information dump. It's not like when you go to the store. I was at uh, Costco the other day filling up. You know, you got to wait about 20 minutes to fill up. And you're like, I don't know if the 30 cents price difference is worth the gas I'm wasting. But anyway, I do it anyway. And, and uh, <clears throat> by sitting here and waiting, I'm filled up. And I, I put that hose in that gas tank. And I pull the lever or squeeze the thingy trigger thing. And I'm one of these guys that is that doesn't like to just stand there and hold it. So I I flip that little switch, and it does it by itself. It's fairly mindless, right? The car is not thinking, now, what do I need to do? I need to, there's no pump working in the car itself. It just receives. It's just, it's like a dump of fuel. That's what this is, just going in. The mind is not like this. This is not how the pastor ought to teach. The pastor ought to teach the people to think critically and biblically about a matter. So while he's teaching the word of God, and while he's communicating the truths of God's word, he's teaching you how to do the Bible study in the whole process. He's showing you the connected tissue of the word of God. He's demonstrating to you how what he's saying is not his own opinions, but is directly from God's word. That's his role. So it's not just information dump and a mindless process, and you just nod and go, okay, 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 receive, you know. Not like that, but rather it's filtered through the biblical text, through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit who gives illumination. Illumination is the Christian teaching that the Holy Spirit makes some things clear to our hearts and minds which otherwise would not be clear. The Bible says this in 1 Corinthians. This is incredible. This is not in the notes. This is free. All right? Not that the... Okay, never mind. Anyway, so the Bible says this in 1 Corinthians. The natural man, that's the person without Jesus who doesn't know the Lord, doesn't have the indwelling Holy Spirit, the lost individual. The natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God because they are spiritually discerned. In other words, there's a kind of knowing that can only be known when the Holy Spirit works in an individual's mind and heart through the reading, hearing, and preaching of God's Word. And then those things become intelligible. That's why you have aha moments. That's why you come away going, oh my goodness, I never saw that before. But you did, sort of, not really. You, you read it, you'd heard things before, but in a moment, the Spirit of God makes something clear to your heart, opens your mind to that. This isn't revelation, that's already been given. We have that. Revelation's already given right here in the Word of God. But this is illumination. God making what is already revealed to you in his word of God clear and understandable because of the work of the Holy Spirit. So this is what happens when God's word comes to you. Now, back to the main point. We've already seen that pastors, elders labor among you. They are appointed over you and they admonish you in the truth. That being said, the main verb here in verse 12, and we're obviously not gonna get to the rest of it, so you'll be able to stick with me a little more in these last remaining few moments. The main verb here is respect. Respect. Here's what 1 Timothy chapter 5 verse 17 says. Let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor. Especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. So there are other kinds of labors in gospel ministry. But the preaching teaching task. He speaks about honor. And in this case double honor. I'm not going to go into that because it's another passage. But you can just take that for what, it, what you see it for at its face value. 1 Corinthians 16, 17, and 18, toward the end of Paul's letter here, he says to these believers, I rejoice at the coming of Stephanus and Fortunus, uh, Fortunatus and, and Achaeus because they have made up for your absence, for they have refreshed my spirit as well as yours. They seem to be traveling laborers in the gospel ministry. He says, give recognition to such people. Now, this is not some sort of veiled, scriptural, twisted, creepy, manipulative uh, attempt to get more honor from you. This is an attempt to give to you a real picture from what God's Word says of the work and the, and, and the respect that is given there. 
Um, I don't know what your thought is on this. Um, I, I have been so, I'll just be very honest with you, for the greater part of over 18, almost 19 years, I have had the incredible honor of serving among you as, my, as your pastor. And I know lots of things have changed over the course of the years. Lots of things have This is not, by the way, coming with some sort of announcement, so you can just chill out a little bit. You're like, where's this thing going, man? You're freaking me out. No, no, no. Just, it, it's just the Lord's been working some things in my own heart. And um, obviously it's a personal message because it's about heavy stuff for me, my responsibility before you, before the Lord. These last uh, two years for pastors across America have been absolutely incredibly difficult. According to a Barna research study, over 38% of pastors are actively considering quitting the ministry altogether. Four out of 10 pastors are, those are those that are honest about this in a survey. Four out of ten, there's about to be in the church in the United States an absolute crisis of leadership. No, if you see this coming, it's all over. This is Barna Institute. This is one of the most respected research. That's a 10% increase in one year. One year, 10% say, I'm actively considering making plans to get out since 2001 to 2002. More concerning than that, a, a study of 46% of pastors under the age of 45, that is to say this next generation, which we've got to have. Hey, Kate, let me stop, by the way. It's pretty bad when I'm the youngest guy at, at 51 this year, when I'm the youngest guy in a ministry room. That's not a good sign. Can I get a witness? <laughs> you're like, yeah, when you're in there, that's not a good sign. <laughs> no, it's not what I'm talking I'm just talking about general age groups, all right? 40... Of those 45 and younger, 46% of them are actively considering quitting the ministry. Like, not what we signed up for. And I wanted to make Christ known. I wanted to make him glorious. I wanted to see the church be healthy and strong. And there's a whole lot of other junk I got to deal with. I mean, this is the mentality, right? This is the reality. In fact, these are those who have heard a clear call. I mean, maybe some of them not so much, but many of them, most of them I would hope, a clear call from God in their spirits, gave up careers for what would more likely be more financially affluent. They considered the cost and they counted Christ and his mission worthy and gave up their lives and education and training and went to it. Listen to this. A third of pastors, you're going to be, you're going to go out of here going, this is the most depressing sermon ever. But you know, this is giving you something to pray for and think on and consider why would Paul even give this scriptural command to show respect? And what, what's, what, what's going on behind the scenes? Think about this. A third of pastors, one third, uh, in, a, in a survey of nearly a thousand, one third of pastors across denominations, okay? Let's make it a good sample size for those of you who understand uh, statistics and the importance of that. One third of pastors describe themselves as healthy. Pause for a moment. Two out of every three pastors said, I am unhealthy physically, mentally, spiritually, psychologically. The toll of ministry, and perhaps other factors in life, is so great that 66 out of 100 pastors say, I'm not in a good place. That's massive, right? What if, if you're an employer... You're, if, you're, if you're someone who works with, what if two-thirds of the workforce said, we're doing really bad? I mean, you understand that this is, I don't know, and I'm sure there, there, there is, and this, again, I'm kind of hesitant to make these kinds of statements because it seems as though it, it, it's self-motivated. It, I really hope that it's not. But I don't know of any other sort of occupation where every aspect of your life is so intertwined and intermingled that you can't tease out one for the other. 
I mean, I can't just be a pastor without being spiritually healthy because then I'm operating in the flesh and in my own power. That's no good for anyone, right? I, I, <laughs> if I'm physically not well, my ministry contribution is going to be diminished, right? I mean, so many things that just come together all in one, it is so convoluted. You don't just leave something at the, at the office door. These are people and lives and families and eternity. I think that's really true of any health-giving, care-giving sort of um, opportunity. When you really care about people, it, it, it just bleeds over into every area. It certainly is true of the pastors. Now, the point of this is to say, <laughs> imagine all of that. And then someone comes with great disrespect and disdain and pecking criticism. There is a proper place for (laughs) gentle, gracious correction, for confrontation, with regard to integrity and truth and righteousness and biblical fidelity. Of course, there should always be recourse. But that's not what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about the petty, little, silly, trifling stuff that makes you wonder, is it even worth it? You tracking with me? I'm not speaking to any specific instance now. You should be comforted to know. I say that insofar as I know (laughs) before the Lord. I'm not pulling out any sort of thing and side-handed trying to come at it. It's not a bully pulpit. That's not the point. My my point is, you can imagine now someone who's doing everything they can to faithfully bring the word of God, sacrifice in many regards, and then there is disrespect over (laughs) what kind of seats we sit in, what kind of color the carpet is, (laughs) whether that wall should be moved or that. Silly, ridiculous little stuff. This program versus that program. The effectiveness of that. I didn't like this light. I didn't like, you know, all the little stuff. I can list names of pastors, many of them friends, whom I went to school with, studied with, well-educated, godly men of integrity who are no longer serving. I had lunch at the convention with a friend who, because of pettiness and rivalries and jealousies within the church, had to step down lest the whole church burst open. The vast majority of people within the church loved their pastor, loved him, served him well, he served them well. It was a sweet mutual relationship, but a small, little, nagging, disgruntled, embittered group were just louder, just louder (laughs) than the majority of those who really wanted to see God. And pastor of a larger church, well-respected in the community, among other pastors, within the, within the, the denominational entity, and uh, praying about what God has for him in, in the future. Because the simple command given here in this scripture was not honored. To show respect. Respect doesn't mean blind subservience. Oh, by no means. But respect. Boy, it goes a long way in your marriage, doesn't it? Can I get a witness? You're not going to agree with each other in your marriage about everything. Am I speaking truth? <laughs> You're not going to agree with your children. Children, there's going to come a time, probably already has, if you're in here, when you, you don't agree with your parents. You, you just fundamentally think that they're not right. Doesn't mean you don't love them. Doesn't mean you don't honor them. You, you fundamentally think on this issue because of your reasoned, perhaps even prayerful thoughts. My parents don't have it right on this thing. That's never cause for lack of respect. Am I right? Moms and dads, grandparents. There come times when your wife doesn't have it right, man. (laughs) And we know for a fact there are times, ladies, when your husband does not have it right. (laughs) That is an established scientific fact. Let me, I'll get the data for you in a minute. (laughs) Men, we don't get it right a lot of times. But that doesn't diminish the honor, ladies, that you give to your husbands and the general respect that you show to them. Believers, what I'm saying to you in the same way in the body of Christ, there should never be a cause or a place 
where because of disagreement, there is a lack of display of grace and in its place a, a display of dishonor where the character and the person of Christ is not preeminent, where a graciousness in disagreements is not there. And I am quite sure, <laughs> I'm old enough to know, that while it feels like smooth sailing now and, and just not, not no active conflicts, that there will be in this body of believers disagreements. And that's okay. Right? I don't agree with myself half the time. Are you, are you with me? I mean, don't you drive down the road debating in your mind the value of this versus that, the benefit of this versus that? I mean, we, we, we're not so fully all together in our own minds. But I'll say this, believers, specifically regard, with regard to the office of pastor teacher, because that's what the context here, but certainly with the, the value of other scripture and, and the, the full witness of scripture, a respect for one another has got to be there. And believers, if we do this one thing, I believe it is at the heart of Christ. Because in doing so, we're going to learn from the next verse. It demonstrates a genuine love. Will you bow your heads for a moment with me? I, I don't know. You may be going, I'm not sure exactly how to apply that. Well, many of you are, are already applying this. So... Uh, you may just go, thank you, Lord, for sweet relationships between in, in the church family. But certainly, the very least, one application is to pray and bring spiritual aid. The Bible calls the Holy Spirit the paraclete, the one who comes alongside. And pray for your pastoral leadership. Pray for your ministry team. Pray for those who labor among you and are over you and admonish you. Pray for those with this solemn sacred task because it is a sobering heavy weight. And doesn't matter if you go on vacation or <laughs> get to bed early at night. That weight doesn't go away. And those burdens can only be lifted at Calvary. Meaning only the great shepherd can fully bear that weight. So pray for those who minister among you that they might learn rightly to give that weight over ultimately to the great shepherd, Jesus Christ. Pray for the state of the church in this country and around the world, that we might be preserved uh, the things that at least statistics seem to forecast. Pray that God would do a great reviving work among his people Pray that those who call themselves believers and followers of Christ would live active, spiritually vibrant lives so as to be able to join in that work and partner together for the glory of God. Pray for the preservation of God's word in our community. Pray for the integrity of those who labor and serve among you and for the integrity of the testimony of the church of Jesus Christ here locally. And then, pray, may I have a willing spirit before the Lord? May I not put up barriers and, and bars that would preclude me from being gracious. Pray that I might be one who is under the hearing of God's word daily, but also um, ready, ready and willing to receive that, that word with a heart that desires for the Spirit of God to work that truth in me. That I'm spiritually illumined or my eyes are open to those truths. Pray that if you would. And then would you pray, Lord, that, that the Lord would bring about a great harvest of souls. That people would come into the kingdom and the family of God and, and would do great things. His arm is not shortened so that it is unable to save. There's no obstacle sociologically societal or otherwise that would keep God from saving souls. It is his chief desire. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And if you're within the hearing of this voice this morning, whether online or in person here, and you don't know Jesus, you have no confidence that eternity would be spent with him, that your soul is secure because of the work that Jesus did on the cross. You're not sure where you stand with God, if you're, to be very honest, this morning. Listen, the great peacemaker, Jesus Christ, has come. And he's come that you might have a life and have it more abundantly. Life to the full. 
And if you would submit your soul to him, say, God, here I am, a messed up person. I've sinned, violated your perfect standards. I don't deserve a hearing before you. I certainly just don't deserve an eternity before you. But I come because of Jesus Christ, and I believe that his death on the cross was the payment for my eternal sins and for my condemnation, and that you took and bore those sins on the cross and came back to life the third day, and I trust you to save me. God, rescue me, bring me back to life from my dead sins, just as Jesus came back to life from the grave and save me. If that describes you all over this place, I would love the privilege of speaking to you. When the service is complete, would you say, Pastor Kevin, I want to talk to you. If you're watching online, would you contact us? There's a Google form that's attached there. Uh, you can email the church, contact us, call us. We want to know how we can minister to you and get you connected with Jesus, not only in relationship, but in growth with him and in your walk with him. Lord Jesus, thank you for your word. Thank you that you are the great overseer and shepherd of our souls. Thank you that, Lord, everything you do is good and right. And, Lord, we trust you. We ask that, Lord, you would work these truths in us and do deep, abiding, preserving work. Not only would you save individuals, but, Lord, I ask that you would preserve uh, the faith that you've granted to us through the work of the Holy Spirit. Guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, we pray. And we ask these things in his name, amen and amen. Would you stand together? We're going to sing this song as we praise the Lord, proclaim his goodness. He's worthy of all glory and honor. Aren't you glad you get to be called a child, a son, a daughter of our king? Let's praise and glorify him uh, at this time.
Before we are sent out in just a moment, a couple quick things um, I want to go over. So um, youth are meeting here this week. We had a really amazing fun time at um, the pool last week. The Steels are a member of a pool, and we basically had the whole thing to ourselves, um, just a couple other people. But it was super fun just to get to hang out and have a devotion by the pool, and it was really, really cool. So um, this week, we're going to be here for regular celebration. And then coming up on the 26th, it's a Tuesday, we're going to be going to Carowinds. Um, the cost is $45, and that is due July 24th. But if you are working VBS, you actually get to go to Carowinds for free. So that was uh, something that finance had, had told me. Dennis was like, yeah, like, you know, we should, that's, that's awesome. We should get to send the kids for free. So um, work VBS, go to Carowinds for free. Um, VBS is July 18th through the 22nd. It's 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. Um, we're going to have um, how you can specifically pray for VBS. We'll give that to you guys um, next week or by way of email, most likely. And um, you guys can be praying. We have 87 kids signed up, and that is a mixture from both um, our registration that we uh, did online. So that's some people that have done VBS through National Hills before, because as you know, we, we don't have a lot of littles right now for in our congregation, but a lot of people really enjoy coming to our VBS. That might be people from the neighborhood or um, those that have just have found us over the years. And then the, um, uh, I'm going to get it wrong, the Augusta Chinese Christian Fellowship. Okay. Um, I always, I just say that the Chinese Christian church, but they, but they have that their full name. I wanted to get it right. They are bringing um, about 45 kids of their own as well. So it's going to be really just awesome to see um, the combination. And we had a really great training on Saturday. Um, Shannon Barwick is not here this morning, but she has done a phenomenal job of just organizing and making sure everything is planned. And you guys can be praying for her. She doesn't even get to be here for it because she has to work full time um, those days. So we're praying that she will be able to at least be here for one of those days to kind of see the fruits of her labor. But otherwise, she is just so excited to be able to have done that and get things ready. And I said, maybe you're actually excited. You, you've done all the prep work and you're just like, have fun. <laughs> but she's, uh, she's done an amazing job. So please keep her in your prayers. And then when you see her, um, please thank her. Um, and regarding that, I still have a few background checks that I need for helpers um, of VBS. So I have a couple with me and I have people that I know. But if you think that you do not have one on file with us and you are helping with VBS, that is a requirement because we let all parents know that everyone who has done that works with VBS has background checks. That goes for even like Pastor Kevin and staff. Everybody has to have one. So um, I, I will get with you a few people that I know. But if you think you need one, please let me know. Um, and lastly, please keep Anna Whaley in your prayers as she's still continuing her internship in Central Asia. Um, I asked Janie, Jamie for an update. She said she was in a village this weekend, so they didn't have internet. Um, they'll be getting updates uh, probably, hopefully, from her in the next few days and, and catch up. And her cold is getting better, but you can imagine being in a new culture with a language happening around you and being sick is really not great. So definitely glad to hear that she's um, getting over that, but continue to pray for her. Um, we try to get out what we can as far as updates, but ultimately just, just the Lord knows the need, so just keep her in your prayers. Well, I want to um, 
just send you out with this pointer to Jesus, right? What, what better way can you leave than to be reminded of what Jesus has done for you? And uh, while this won't come immediately in your mind as a blessing, what he did for us in these verses is a blessing. Let's just be thankful and be in, of thankful spirit as we hear these words. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he didn't revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sins and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. You who are straying like a sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Thank you, Jesus, that you are just that, the one who feeds and provides and brings us back and oversees and superintends our souls. Thank you, Lord. We entrust ourselves to you now. This week, we pray blessings upon these who are here under the hearing of your word and those who will hear your word in future days from this. Lord, we ask great blessings, and may we always see Jesus high and lifted up. We ask these things for his sake. Amen.